My name is Pastor Stanley Mwalili, coming to you from the Green Pastures Tabernacle Church online service on Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in and just being with us. I pray that today you have at least remembered to share with someone the link and also to create a watch party because that's the only way we can be a blessing to one another because remember we are blessed to be a blessing. And so before we get into the word, allow me once again, as is our custom, to just spend a few minutes in prayer. Uh, every time we gather together, it is important that we raise an, a prayer to God because prayer changes not only things, but it also changes us. Uh, this morning, I have a few prayer items. I want us to pray for our nation and our leaders uh, during this season so that God will give them wisdom and good health. And then I also want us to pray for complete eradication of the COVID-19 virus from our nation and the world. We must continue praying and believing God that despite the negative news and the high rate of infection, that it is still possible to deal with this, uh, you know, miraculously and also medically. We pray that also we shall continue to bear fruit even in this season. Our Christianity is not threatened. We must continue to bear fruit because we are, uh, we are planted by the river and in and out of season we bear fruit. And then we pray that we will see opportunities to grow and become a blessing also to other people. And then we also pray for the unity in the body of Christ and so that we shall be grounded in the word and also establish in him. Kindly join with me and let us just call upon the name of the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift our nation before you today. Father, you have given us leaders and you have asked us to first and foremost pray for our leaders so that we shall live holy and godly lives. Father, I pray that you grant them wisdom and good health during this time. And that, Father, as they lead the nation through these times of trouble and turmoil, that you will grant them the capacity to do so. Thank you, Lord, that you will help them to be able to uh, rise above the limitations and the situations that make many leaders fail, and especially during the times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Father, give our president wisdom. Surround him with the right kind of people that are going to give him the kind of uh, support and advice that will help our nation. Lord, keep him off evil and wicked people that are only interested in taking advantage of situations to enrich themselves. Expose evil-minded people and keep them away further from leading our nation to the glory of your name. Lord, we also pray for the complete eradication of COVID-19 virus from our nation and in the world. Lord, we join the very many Christians who are in prayer as well as the many doctors and medical practitioners that are hunting for a cure as well as a vaccine. Father, we pray that in Jesus' name, Lord, you will come through for us and help us to deal with this problem so that we can be able to live lives that are not threatened and mass by one particular virus. Lord, I pray that it shall be so to the glory of your name. Father, we continue to pray for ourselves that you help us not to be discouraged to a point of not bearing fruit as believers and as Christians. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes, open our minds, that we shall look around for opportunities to share the good news to somebody and also, Father, to be a blessing physically through food and otherwise to people who may be needing support in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, help us to be able to do that so that our faith can shine and that also we can continue being sought, the sword of the earth and the light of the world as you have commanded us. Help us so that, Lord, our light will so shine before men so that men see our good works and praise you who is in heaven. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will also look for opportunities to be able to grow and become a blessing in this season to other people. Father, I pray that we shall not be selfish, O oh Lord, that we shall be able to stretch out and share what we have with the others. And Lord, I also pray for the unity of the body of Christ, that we shall be grounded in word and established in faith. Father, we are living in days when there are so many conspiracies and some that have to do with the end times. And Lord, we are open to deception. I pray, Father, that you help us and especially that the church will be united, that despite the many different opinions that pervade our landscape in the spiritual atmosphere, that Father, you help us 
you remain united to the glory and honor of your name. We worship you, Father, and we pray that you open our heart today, that as we receive your word, that we shall be instructed of you in spirit. We worship you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me in that session of prayer. It's wonderful to come to you, and it's always a privilege to be able to share the word of God with us and just learning, you know, different things from the depth of God's word. And I pray that you're really getting blessed. Kindly remember to let us know how this ministry is touching you. It is possible to just send a comment. Let us interact. You know, Facebook Live is different from, you know, meeting face to face. It's very difficult for me to ask you questions, but at least you can write something. You can let us know what is helping you. You can let us know what is not clear. You can let us know what has blessed your heart and what has encouraged you. That way we are able to know that we are actually ministering to you. So please feel free to just interact with us. Uh, send a, a comment, you know, uh, you know, like the, like, 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 like the message, like, like the page, and, and, and just share with your friends and so that we can be a blessing to one another. Now, getting into the Word of God, I want us to talk about a topic uh, that is very important in these days, and this is the topic of deception. Deception. Believe it or not, there is a lot of deception already taking place. Of course, it has been there, but in such moments, deception heightens up because of several things that we'll be looking at a little later on. And so I'll be taking this probably in about uh, three segments, uh, three sermons hopefully. And today I want us to introduce with understanding deception. I want us to try and have some basic understanding of deception from the Bible. And if you will, please go with me to the Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 24. This is a very important chapter, uh, Jesus Christ himself talking, and it is important to remember that many of the things that we are grappling with, they are not a surprise because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, foresaw them, he talked about them, and much, much later, even the apostles talked about these things. So let them not appear like they are really new things, but it is important that we are reminded that we need to be aware of these things because Jesus saw it fit to talk about these things. And so, um, uh, Matthew chapter 24, let me begin from verse 1 to um, 14, and then I'll read verse 23 to 25, quite a bit of reading, but I think it is important to be able to read Scripture because the Scripture is inspired. It is the Word of God, and it really blesses us. Now, the Bible says in verse 1 of Matthew 24, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. In verse 3, Now as he sat... On the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up for tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But who, he who endures to the end shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached 
in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Verse 23 to 25. This is what the Bible says. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is a Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false prophets, false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Now, Matthew chapter 24 is really one of those scary chapters, and few of us really preach from it, because as you would be aware, that many ministers of God are really not inclined to teaching about the end times. The end times, the technical word for end times is eschatology, you know, the events that will be preceding the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see Jesus Christ, you know, he decided to give the disciples a sneak preview of what was going to happen. And the opening verse, especially verse 1, was very astounding because if you would understand, the temple in Jerusalem was quite a magnificent, magnificent piece of artwork and design and architecture. And for Jesus, you know, to, uh, to, to, to talk the way he talked after the disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple, you know, he said something very, very heartbreaking. He said, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And, you know, him speaking like that, you know, brings us to our present world today where you begin to realize that after the kind of shakeup that we are, we are going through, then you realize even some of the most magnificent, you know, structures and establishments and governments of the world and things we have really valued can within a day be brought to nothing. And that begins to tell us that the things that Jesus talked about are real. However... I am not going to focus on the issue of the returning of the Lord Jesus. We'll do that probably at a later date. But now, they allow me to introduce the, 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 the ministry and deal with understanding deception. By the end of this sermon today, I pray that you would have understood something about deception. Now, by way of introduction, human beings are tragically susceptible to deception. It's amazing how we can easily get deceived. And you don't need to go far. You just need to read a little bit and look around and see how many people have been deceived. It's amazing how you find somebody who is educated, somebody with a PhD, somebody who is a professor, someone who is really, you know, civilized, and you look at the kind of things they are getting involved in, in the name of worship, in the name of God, or sometimes even in the name of their religion, which is completely difficult to appreciate. Even common sense is not able to explain. You know, we have recently seen very interesting situations where you find, you know, uh, someone purporting to be a pastor, you know, gets people to eat grass. I saw some who are supposed to eat a snake. And, you know, all these things are being done in the name of the faith. And you are amazed how tragic that can be because that just tells you that human beings are really, really susceptible to deception. The Latin root for the word deceive means to ensnare or to seize or to take. And the Latin definition emphasizes our tendency to be easily caught up or carried away or to be ensnared by error. So when you look at the Latin understanding of the word deception, it brings this aspect of either being seized or being taken. It's like when somebody is deceived, they are no longer in control of themselves. They do not seem to be in control of their thinking, their will, and their capacity to exercise discernment or even something like common sense that is hopefully given to us all by God freely. You know, this definition of Latin evokes the image of an animal that is being carried off a spray in the mouth of a lion. Those of you that have watched a lion hunting, as soon as it lands on an animal, it looks like it, you know, drives some sort of paralysis in that animal that even the animal is unable to even fight back because it's been captured 
by a very powerful um, predator. Now, the Greek word for deceive is also the root of the English word planet. And it literally means wandering body. You know, planets are bodies that, you know, go around a certain other bigger body in the planet. And there are so many other planets that just wander in space in a certain uh, kind of orbit. And this Greek definition means to go astray, to wander off course, and to deviate from the correct path, to roam into error or to be misled. So again, like we said sometimes back when we were looking at another Greek word, you find that in Greek and Hebrew, words have very heavy meaning. And unlike the Latin one, we see that in the Greek definition of deception, it has something to do with someone going astray, you know, missing the way and wandering, of course, leaving the particular pathway that someone is supposed to walk, deviating from the route that they are supposed to be and walking and roaming into error or being misled. And in Greek, this term nearly always carries the idea of the sin of roaming from the truth. So again, you know, Hebrew brings in the element of sinning so that then when we talk about deception, it goes deeper to explain that every time we wander away from the truth, then it is a sinful aspect where people move away from what is right and get into the wrong things. It also emphasizes that we go astray or are led astray that we wander off. It has something to do with being led away. People don't just walk away. Most of the time you find that deception has a source. It is rare that you can be a source of deception unless you are also getting it from either a certain writing or reading or someone that you follow closely. And that's why the prophet Isaiah cried about this thing in Isaiah 53 verse 6 when he said, or oh, we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The prophet Isaiah seeing into the future, speaking many, many years before the Lord Jesus Christ, he saw that human beings would be taken away in error. Of course, he saw that Adam and Eve had been taken to error and we have all wandered away as Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus taking the punishment for us being in error so that we can be redeemed. Now, it is important to say now that error is the state or condition of being wrong in conduct of judgment. Everybody has the capacity to error because we don't know everything. It is possible that due to the limitation of our understanding of issues and knowledge, we can get into error. So we get into error, and then when we are in error, then we are in a state or condition where we are wrong in the way we conduct ourselves and in the way that we judge issues. Now, deceit is the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. What happens is when we walk in error, then we get to a place whereby we begin to cause other people to accept as true our error and that which is false and invalid and therefore we begin to lead others into deception. So what this means is that error will always lead to deceit if it is not addressed early. And that's why you find that many people have become deceitful. They have gone into deception also because they believed in error and stayed in error and because nobody corrected them and no one was willing to correct them or there was nobody available to correct, then people got into deceit. Now, allow me to take you through levels of deception because you need to know that there are levels of deception. The first level is when you are a victim. The first level is a victim level. Now, a victim of deception is one who has been adversely affected, injured, destroyed, or hurt by deception. 
So a victim is actually the object of deception. It is the person to whom deception is targeted. And so this is the person that deception actually adversely affects in way of injuring them, you know, destroying them or hurting them, depending on whether the hurt is physical or spiritual, whatever manner it is, and they end up really paying the price of being deceived. And when we go to scripture, we find an example of a victim. This is the level one of deception. And this is if the Bible says in Genesis 3, verse 13, after Adam and Eve have sinned, the Bible says, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Adam, I mean, Eve was simply saying, I became a victim of the deception of Satan and so I have committed a sin. I've been destroyed. I've been injured. I'm affected because I went into the level one of deception and I am a victim. We also see again in Genesis 3.16, where now God is meeting out punishment because December, remember when you're a victim, you are the recipient of injury and the adverse effect of the deception. Genesis 3.16, the Bible says to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Uh, if being a victim of deception, deception she then bears a brand of injury destruction hurt and also things that should not necessarily have been there and then the other consequence of course this one affects both adam and eve because remember they were both deceived in genesis 3 23 to 24 therefore the lord god sent him out of the garden of eden to till the ground from which he was taken so he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So basically I'm using those scriptures to show you that when at the first level of deception you are a victim and as a victim of deception you are adversely affected and injured and destroyed by that hurt or, or by that deception. And we see that the woman is actually cursed, man is cursed, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, they are driven out of the garden. And so please understand that the first level of deception is the victim level. The second level is deceiver level, deceiver. And a deceiver is the one who causes someone else to accept or to believe as a true or as true or valid what is false or invalid. Deceiver now is the agent of deception. A deceiver is a person who comes with the deception to hurt the person that needs or who becomes a deceiver. And in 2 John verse 7, the Bible says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. And this is a deceiver and antichrist. And so I want you to notice that for there to be a victim, there has to be a deceiver. So level one is a person who is ready to be deceived or is able and capable of being deceived. And the second level is the deceiver and the agent of deception. In the first case where we read about Adam and Eve, it was Satan. But in this case, then the apostle is warning that there are many deceivers that have gone out in the world. And we need to beware, friends, that since they are deceivers, then it is possible that many of us could easily become first-level uh, victims of deception. Then the third level is what we call victims come deceivers. These are people who are also victims, but they are also deceivers. In other words, they play victim, but at the same time, they are also aiding in the deception. A victim come deceiver is a person who fails to rebuke and instead encourages the deceiver to carry on deception. And the most unfortunate thing is that there are so many people that fall into this category where we are aware or we can sense that someone is deceiving, but we do not have the capacity to actually stop them. And then we also become the ones encouraging them to continue in their deception. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
evil men and imposters will grow worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, they will be playing both roles. They will be victims, but they will also be getting deceived as well as being deceptive themselves. There is no other place it is put best, especially in the Bible, except in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. The Bible says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This is tragically what has happened a lot in the world today. We have so many of us that have itching ears. There are things we want to hear, and because we become victims of de deception, then we provide a fertile ground for deceivers to deceive us, and then we are, when they are deceiving us, we applaud them. We want them to, to tell us more. We tell them, please, increase the volume because we want to hear. What is happening is at that point, we are playing double. We are not just victims or deceivers, but but we are actually both victims and deceivers and we need to be careful friends because so many people are falling into this trap and that is why the church finds herself where she is today where we keep applauding people that are deceiving us we keep applauding systems and structures that are taking us to destruction we cannot rebuke them but we cannot also let them keep quiet because they enjoy deceiving us because we receive it gleefully and we even finance it so that they can continue to do what they need to do. May God help us because we are either in any of these levels. Level one as victims or level two as deceivers or level three as both victims and deceivers. We are playing both. It's like when you are a receiver and also a, a transmitter at the same time. You transmit and you receive like a telephone. A telephone can throw signals, it can also receive. And that's how many people have become today where we are actually aiding a deception. We are listening to it. We have an idea that there is something wrong, but because it sounds exciting, it promises certain things we want. We let people continue to deceive us and lie to us. And eventually we become not only victims, but also deceivers ourselves. What are the causes of deception? Why do people get deceived? I'll give you a number of reasons why we are deceived. What are the causes of deception? The first cause that I see in scripture is simply ignorant of scripture. When we are ignorant of what God says, then we become victims and targets of deception. Ignorance of scripture is the state of fact of lacking knowledge, education, or awareness, understanding, or intelligence of the word of God. Let me repeat, because this is important. Ignorance of scripture is that state when we lack knowledge, education, awareness, understanding, or intelligence of the word of God. It's amazing how Christianity is one of the few places where people who are not qualified even to handle the word are allowed to do so. I'm yet to see a doctor who has never gone to school treating people. They tend to do that, but very soon they are arrested as being quacks and they are put where they belong. It's amazing that for a long time we have allowed the church to be the ground where people who are not qualified will come to practice what they believe is what they know. And this becomes fertile ground for deception because you're dealing with people who are ignorant of scripture, lacking knowledge, education, awareness, understanding, or intelligence of the word of the Lord. If you are to professionally and technically deal with a subject, then you need to be qualified to deal with that subject. And it is important that we begin to insist that people somehow find a way of being taught in the knowledge of the word of God. I insist that it is important that those of us that handle the word of God must have a proper working knowledge of scripture. I know when we go to work, usually they will tell you that we need someone who has a proper working knowledge of this particular package, either in systems 
or in, uh, in, 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 in analysis of data and stuff. We need to be people that are able to be knowledgeable in the word of God. Because the Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject your children. And I will reject you also as my priest. God is so uh, categorical about the problem of ignorance that is willing to reject us together with our children when we become ignorant. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, the Bible says, this is Jesus Christ talking. He says, you are mistaken, and that word mistaken in another translation is also translated as deceived. In others, you can read, and Jesus answered and said to them, you are deceived, not knowing the scriptures, know the power of God. The moment we are ignorant of scripture, friends, and we do not know the power of God, then we become candidates of deception. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, the Bible says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that the wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused, I want you to notice, they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. I want you to notice that Second Thessalonians, the apostle writing to the church, he is talking to them about the coming of the lawless ones, lawless one. And these are the last days. And he says that in fact they will come, or rather, he will come with all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing and says something powerful. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so that they are saved. One of the reasons why people are where they are today is because people have simply rejected the truth. When you try to teach and help people understand the truth, they are not interested because then there is something they are excited about and they want some shortcuts. And that's why the Bible says for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Don't get surprised when hundreds or thousands of people are led to a lie and they don't seem to understand it's a lie. Because the moment you reject truth, then God changes the play, the game, and he sends them a powerful delusion, which is a spirit that covers their understanding and they begin to believe the lie, even when they look like they should see that this is a lie. So the first cause of deception, my friend, don't get lost, is ignorance of scripture. I pray that you will understand this and begin to take the word of the Lord much more. Seriously. The second cause of deception is indifference to the consequences of our actions. When we become indifferent to what happens when we do the things that we do, when we become indifferent to the seed that we sow and we don't care about the fruit and the harvest that we harvest, then we are ripe for deception. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7 to 8, do not be deceived. The Bible begins with a warning. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let me tell you something. If people become indifferent to the consequences of the things that we do, of the lies that we believe, of the doctrines that we take on, of the things that we support, and we do not care about the consequences of those things, I'm telling you, we are on our way to very big time deception. And we have already seen people that never cared what would happen until it was too late. They discovered that they are already in trouble and they are reaping terribly the results of or the consequence of their action. My friend, if you do not want to be deceived, please pay attention to what would happen if you do what you are about to do especially if you've been warned against it. The third cause of deception is an unhealthy fascination with the prophetic and the spectacular. I'm calling it unhealthy because there's nothing wrong with us taking interest in prophets. In fact, the Bible says, I want each one of you to desire to prophesy. 
and to be a prophet. It's very important for us to decide the prophetic, to be able to move in the prophetic. But what happens is when we develop an unhealthy fascination with the prophetic and with the miraculous and even, you know, the spectacular, then we are opening ourselves up for deception because when you look at what is recorded would be happening in the last days then the devil and the man of lawlessness will use the spectacular and the prophetic as a magnet to draw people away so that he can actually deceive them going back to the verse that we read in second thessalonians 2 9 to 11 the bible says the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how certain works he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve a lie. I'm not saying, friends, that signs and wonders are wrong, but the devil has realized that people love signs and wonders. I remember one time as a young man, I will never forget this, we went, I can't remember whether it was on Nakuru show or Nairobi show, and there were these guys who were having something that looked like, a, you know, a, a pit that has been dug and then lined up with a piece of cloth. And then they will raise the wall a little bit. And then they will stand there and they are actually telling you that they, there is a four, there is a four, a four horned sheep inside there. And you know, they create a lot of anxiety and excitement and you have to pay them before you peep. And the moment you pay and peep, you actually find there is absolutely nothing inside there. And there was a huge queue of people because they created this kind of fascination because we are excited and we like the spectacular. Let me tell you something. The Bible says the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. How does he work? He uses all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve a lie. Let me tell you something. Signs and wonders are powerful, but we must have discernment to know what kind of signs and powers and spectacular things are being undertaken. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 11 to 24, the Bible says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And this is a very difficult place because, serious friends, we need prophecy. We need the spectacular. We need to see miracles. We need to see signs and wonders. But the thin line between deception and these things is so serious that so many people have fallen into deception. Show me many deceived people, and I'll show you people that were are following prophecies. Oh, prophet, what is God telling me? What is God saying about my life? What is going to happen? Oh, prophet of God, when will this happen? When will I receive this? And right now, as we confront issues of, say, the locusts and the COVID-19 you know, pandemic, we are already beginning to hear a lot of prophecies and people gathering. And very soon, we start having great movements of people who are promising wonderful things and understanding. Others will come with even ways of making sure that you're safe. And you have not lost to a fact that very soon somebody will build an ark and begin to take two people in so that they can be saved. Because I can tell you these things are going to happen. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I just know that the Bible says many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. And for false prof Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Please don't get lost. We are talking about causes of deception. We have already seen cause number one is being ignorant of scripture. Cause number two is indifference to the consequences of our actions. We are not careful about our harvest because then we don't care what seeds we sow. And then number three, an unhealthy fascination with the prophetic and the spectacular. This has caught very many. Those people that are able to be prophetic and are spectacular, they draw big crowds. Everybody wants to be part of a place where big people are prophesying every hour, every minute, where the spectacular is happening and strange things happening. And yet those are also, as much as they are important things to do, they actually fertile ground for deception. Number four, religious hypocrisy. Religious hypocrisy is also a cause of deception. Religious hypocrisy is the pretense or belief of what one is not. We are many people who carry themselves as Christians, as believers, and they want to show like they are. They try to sing like believers. 
They even try to give offerings. They even try to do and serve church. But they are actually practicing hypocrisy because they are pretending or believing what they are not. It is behavior that contradicts what one claims to believe, the false assumption of an appearance of godliness. It's amazing how there are people today who walk into church and they are actually worshiping idols, they are worshiping Satan, they are actually into occult, and they sing with us, they worship with us, and they pretend to be Christian. It's amazing how deception has actually crept into the church. That there are so many people, religious hypocrites, who pretend that they are actually believing what they are not, and they are not Christians at all. And that's why James, in chapter 1, verse 22 to 27, says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I want you to notice that every time we hear the word of God, and we don't do what the word says, then we become self-deceivers. We are both deceived, and we also deceive ourselves. In fact, we are playing a double. We are being deceived, and we are also deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his nature, natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was, but he looks, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I challenge you to be who you are. If you're a Christian, please be a Christian. Practice the word. When you read the word, do what the word says. But if you are not a Christian, please stop pretending you're a Christian. Be just what you're supposed to be and stop confusing what God has so graciously and lovingly given us. In conclusion of this topic, understanding deception, I want to just give you three points and then I will be done. The first thing that I want to tell you is that anybody can be deceived. Stay alert. Anybody can be deceived. Pastors, preachers, bishops, apostles, presidents, CEOs, professors, children. Anybody, anybody is a candidate of deception. And you just need to look around and you see so many people that have been deceived by huge, huge lies that are obvious, but for some reason... People cannot see the lie. Matthew 24, 24, the Bible says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's why I'm saying anybody can be deceived, even the elect. Those people that God has personally chosen led to Christ and redeemed them, even those ones, if they are not careful, the Bible says they will be deceived. And we have already seen wonderful people that started well, but today they are no more. One of the cries of my heart as a minister of the gospel is that I will not get to a place where I become deceived because it looks like the more we stay in the Lord and the more we stay in the ministry, especially as pastors, the easier it gets for us to be deceived because we are seeing so many of us, wonderful men of God, who started humble, preaching the true and adulterated word of God. And we get to a place whereby we change and begin to preach something that is totally alien to what the gospel is all about. May God help us. May God help me as he helps many of my friends and servants of God as well as you believers who so love the Lord but are also victims of a lot of uh, deceit that has gone around. So please remember, as we conclude, number one, anybody can be deceived, so you must stay alert. You must listen to the Spirit of God because I believe if you are well taught and you have read the Bible, you have studied the Word, you will know when an alert is coming on when a lie is being taught you. If you've really been taught of the word of God and you walk up with the spirit, the moment a deceiver begins to speak and to do things, something comes up and tells you, this is not right. Please run away and do not uh, go after it. When you really want to know that something is of God, there is a certain humility that accompanies what is of God, that you can mistake it. There's a, ten, a certain sweetness of spirit that comes when you are dealing with something of God. It doesn't matter how gifted, anointed somebody is. The moment people begin to be um, proud and, you know, arrogant and abrasive, 
just in the name of the Lord, then you know you could be dealing with a potentially deceptive situation because that is not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is a spirit of meekness. That even when God rebukes us, he actually would do it firmly, but there will be that sweetness and lovingness that comes with the voice of God because we are tended to by grace in this season of time that God is dealing with us through his son, Jesus Christ. Number two, number two, what you need to know is that the word of God is the only antidote against deception. An antidote is something that cures that which has the potential to kill you. For example, if a snake bites you, you need to find the right antidote that is made out of serum, hopefully from a similar or the same snake. So the word of God is the antidote against deception. You need to have a deep knowledge and understanding of scripture. If there is anything I encourage Christians to do, we need to be people of the word. We need to be people that not only listen to the word, but we read the word ourselves. Take every opportunity to study the word, to read it, and to just ensure that you really have a deep knowledge and understanding of the word. Because every time the fake comes, you'll be able to have a standard against which you can measure that is being thrown against you. Acts 17 verse 10 to 11. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in the Salonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures to daily, sorry, searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. These Berean Christians have been quoted many times. And we have hoped that many, many Christians can have the Berean spirit where you don't just take words because they have been preached by a bishop, by a pastor, by a pope, or whoever they are, that they may be good, wonderful men. Remember, Paul and Silas were actually powerful ministers. The Bible says they went to Berea, and when they arrived, they got into a synagogue of the Jews. But these Jews were different. They were actually, the Bible says, fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. The, the Thessalonian Christians were just happy, amen, excited, amen, yeah, tell us more. And after the Bible was closed, they closed the Bible until the following day when the preacher came. It was not so with the Bereans. The Bible says they received the word with readiness. They didn't doubt it. But after that, the Bible says, they search the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. How I pray that we can have a Berean spirit in our hearts, in our midst, in this country, so that when people teach us something, we can go back to scripture and learn it. When a, a preacher says something, you don't just say amen and get excited and lift your seat you have reason to go dig deeper and find out, is this what the Bible says? Is this what God is saying in this verse? Because what has happened is that because of lack of this Berean spirit has led to so much deception that the church is weak than it's supposed to be. And finally, number three, the prophetic and the spectacular are not always godly. The prophetic and the spectacular are not always godly. And so what you need to do is exercise discernment. What am I saying? I'm not opposed to the prophetic, to the spectacular. I really desire that I will be prof I will prophesy. I love the spectacular. I love it when God moves in power. I have been in situations where I sense the power of God moving both in my life and in other people's lives. I remember one time I went to a conference in, in, in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and we were, I was supposed to preach. And, you know, we worshiped, and the presence of God was powerful in the town hall in, 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 in Bulawayo, that's the second largest city of, of Zimbabwe. And I remember my, my friend, Apostle Nyati, giving me the microphone when I stood. You know, the entire worship team just collapsed behind me. I didn't know what to do. I could not speak. I could not preach. I just had to leave the microphone there. I went and hid under the seats. And we lay there for hours. The presence was so powerful. We closed the meeting. I went to sleep. I couldn't sleep. It's like my stomach was on fire. The whole night, I couldn't sleep. That's spectacular. I don't know what God was doing. He was probably birthing some stuff in my life. And that's powerful. But let me tell you something. Even in the midst of all that, we must exercise discernment. We must ask, is this God at work? Because we know that people are using other powers. People are using other forces 
to deceive many people because we have already seen it happen in many, many places. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Let me tell you, testing spirits is not wrong. Testing spirits is not questioning the authority of people who speak in the name of the Lord. We need to do it respectively. It doesn't mean that just because you are testing spirits, you disrespect or abuse a servant of God. It is important to use the right parameters, and the Bible says that we need to test every spirit. And as we continue, I believe I'll be giving you probably a few more keys on how you can be able to engage and appreciate how to deal with deception. I pray that today's message has somehow awakened you up. I know this is a subject that we rarely talk about, but I just felt led of the spirit, especially during this time where there are so many conspiracy theories about what is happening, what is the cause of the, you know, the locust invasion. Many people are alluding this to sinfulness and God's punishment. Others pointing out to the COVID-19 as a sign that God is very unhappy with everybody and all these things and others beginning to talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus, a chip that is supposed to be introduced in our bodies and all these things we are talking about. They may be true or maybe not, but what we need to know, friends, is we must appreciate that be careful that deception is real and if we are not careful, the Bible says even the elect, they are going to be deceived. I pray that your heart will not be troubled, that you will be solid in your understanding of the word of God so that you can come to the place where you know that this is wrong. And the only way to do that is to be aware of the genuine so much that when the fake comes, you know it. I'm told in the banks when they train tellers of how to detect fake currency, they don't train them with fake currency. They make their fingers used to the real currency so many times that the moment you sleep in a fake note, it will just be picked. And that's the same thing. We need to be so much aware of the real Christ, the real God, the real spirit of God, that when an alien spirit creeps in, you just know this is wrong and you need that sensitivity. And my prayer for you today is that God will lead you to a place whereby you know that this thing is not of God, that what I'm hearing is not of God. This teaching is not of God and you reject it and go back straight to the word of God, no matter how hard and spectacular it sounds. And God will bless you and help you. Let me just pray with you so that God will comfort you and reassure you that it is one. Those of you that may have fallen into deception, my prayer is that God will rescue you and deliver you from that place where you are not just a victim, but also a person that is able to walk out and be freed from that kind of a place.